today for you as well. NBC Sports Bay Area 49ers insider Matt Mayoko. This is the day that the book that you've been spending some time on, uh, it's released today, Letters to 87, Fans Remembering the Legacy of Dwight Clark. I, I don't want to speak so much for the book. I've gotten a peek, but just kind of give us a little insight. What exactly is Letters to 87 and, and how did it come about? Yeah, Kiana, this is something where it's because of Dwight Clark. There's like no other person in the Bay Area history of sports that could kind of brought so many people together to complete this book. 118 letter writers uh, sent letters to Dwight Clark when he was struggling with ALS. And Dwight loved to hear those stories from the fans. And he always wanted a book where fans were telling stories about their memories of the catch, how it impacted them, etc. And when he was struggling, he told me how much he wanted to read letters from fans. And so I put the call out and these letters came flooding in and the letters were phenomenal. And Dwight moved to Whitefish, Montana. I was fortunate enough to take those letters up there along with Keena Turner, Ronnie Lott, and some others. And on a day where, where Dwight wasn't feeling well at all, and it was two, two weeks before he passed away, he heard these letters that we were reading to him, and his spirits just, you, you could just see how much it, it lifted him. Some of these letters were hilarious, you know, with, with some kind of, uh, you know, inappropriate language. <laughs> That, that brought everybody to laughter. There were other letters that just brought you to tears because yeah. they were so poignant and so emotional. Uh, there was a lot of talk about family, how the catch impacted families. Uh, there was a, the, a lot from the, the long-suffering 49er fans that finally had their moment against the Cowboys. Um, you know, there were funny stories about things that happened uh, in living rooms or in the stands at the time of the catch. Well, Dwight loved it. And Dwight wanted to see a book he wanted there to be a book that would benefit the Golden Heart Fund. I was a little bit skeptical whether there would be a book, but so many people rallied. Cameron and Company and Petaluma said, we're going to do this book. We're going to do it. Uh, Brad Mangin, Michael Zagaris with the photos. Uh, you know, Kirk Reynolds did a lot of work behind the scenes. Brian Murphy wrote a poignant piece, beautiful piece, about what the scene was like inside uh, Dwight's bedroom when he read the letters. And then so much support from, you know, Mr. DeBarlo, the entire 49ers organization. Uh, Ronnie Lott uh, wrote something. Joe Montana wrote something. It was just a, a really group effort. Everybody always came together because of Dwight. And so this was our way of honoring Dwight Clark and the legacy. That's incredible. You said 118 letters that yeah. came from fans. There's essays from his teammates, from friends, from his wife. Uh, you talked about there were some that, you know, brought laughter, <laughs> some that brought tears. Is there one in particular that you care to share that, that really just kind of stood out to you and kind of embodies who Dwight Clark was off the field and on the field? Well, uh, you know, there there are so many, and I could I could go on. This is – how long is the show? We can make – this yeah, is the Matt we'll, Mayoko we'll, show. We'll go uh, for four hours talking <laughs> about this. I would say the one letter that really stood out was the one that got the biggest r response from him, and it was from Matt Foley, who lives in San Rafael. In fact, he and his family are here today because this is a family that's really been affected by ALS. And so he sent a letter – in which he also included a piece of turf. And Matt Foley wasn't at that game, but his mom and dad were. In those days at Candlestick Park, to leave the stadium, you had to exit down where they were sitting. You'd exit down to the field. His father, Don Foley, went out to the field where he thought Dwight Clark made the catch and grabbed the biggest piece <laughs> of turf he could possibly find. So this was considered a family heirloom for the Foley family. And... When Matt Foley heard my call for people to send letters, he said, I'm going to send Dwight Clark a piece of that turf. Wow. And so when he told his 85-year-old dad that he was going to do this, his dad broke down crying because wow. that's how much it meant to him. When Kina presented Dwight with that bag of turf, the look on Dwight's face was priceless. Wow. It meant so much to him. And, you know, it was part of the documentary it's certainly part of this book. The first thing that Dwight Clark, and this really, I mean, it, it's still, it's tough to talk about. I was there, I saw it, and I know what happened. Uh, Dwight made the comment at that time, I'm taking that with me. Wow. And we all know what that means. Yeah. Um, and he did take that with him. 
And to me, that's symbolic of this relationship he had with the fans. He provided the biggest play in 49ers franchise history, one of the biggest play, if not the biggest play in NFL history. He gave so much to the fans, and this was symbolic of the fans giving back to him and really tying that circle of this unbelievable union that Dwight Clark had uh, as a player, but but mostly as a person in the Bay Area, and so always so accessible to his fan base. Absolutely. You talk about different fans and, and the impact that that play had on their life, but I, I kind of want to get to know from you. Can you recall where you were in your time when you saw that play? Uh, paint that picture for me. Yeah, I, I was a 49er fan growing up in Northern California in Chico. Uh, but in those days, you know, even uh, before that, obviously, but in, in, in the late 70s, the 49ers weren't always on TV. There were times where they got blacked out at home at, for home games because there weren't enough fans going or there just wasn't enough interest. So there were some times when they weren't even on TV. Um, I was always conditioned, uh, and they lost three times to the Cowboys in the playoffs in the early 70s. I wasn't around for those. I don't remember those. But I was always conditioned for bad things happening to the 49ers. So my actually, my first thought when Dwight came out of nowhere, like he was nowhere on the screen, and then all of a sudden, he just caught the ball. My first thought was, oh, these are the 49ers. The 49ers break the the hearts of their fans. There's probably a penalty. It's coming back. It's not going to stand. And I was like, kind of looking around, going, "Is it? Is it? Wait, wait a minute. Is it? Is it? Is there a penalty? No penalty." And by the time it really sunk in that it was a touchdown, Ray Wershing was kicking the extra point. Oh wow! <laughs> and, and the 49ers had taken the lead. And then you know, Eric Wright and the defense had to hold on. Right. But I remember just thinking, this can't be true. The 49ers, 49ers don't beat the Dallas Cowboys. And that play right there was in the in the history of the NFL, it really um, started the 49ers on a sleep steep incline and you know they won the Super Bowl two weeks later and it really started the Dallas Cowboys on on a slide so it was a very important play in uh, in football history and there's another letter writer Marley Ortega from from Petaluma who put it really put it all in perspective and I got a chance to meet Marley we've met several times she's a wonderful person and she said uh, she talked about that you know Dwight your your hands reaching for the stars and you come down with that ball and she said the thing that that put it to the level of perfection that play was the person who made the play you know it, it was a great play it mm-hmm. was one of the greatest plays ever had it been somebody other than Dwight Clark who maybe didn't handle that success all that well, uh-huh. it still would have been a great play. Absolutely. But Dwight Clark, because of how he embraced it, because of how he loved to share that moment with the fans, he had a, I would be places with Dwight, and people would come up to him and say, I was there. And he would get the biggest smile on his face, and he would start asking questions as if that was the first time he heard that. Wow. And we know he heard it from thousands of people probably a few people who weren't even there but kind of like to say they were but he loved to hear those stories about the fan from the fans about the catch and about the impact of the catch and um i mean this book he wanted this book i think he'd be really proud of this book absolutely um of NBC Sports Bay Area 49ers insider Matt Mayoko here with us for your 49ers live look in. I also want to give you guys a little shot of what's going on behind us at practice. So Matt, you and I, we can sure. step off, let, let everybody kind of get a peek at what's going on at practice. And which I'm, I'm going to move to the shade. Yeah, I, I, let's, let's go to the shady area over here, uh, which I'm so glad you, you brought up, you know, the impact that the, that, that the catch had on so many 49ers fans. Even me coming into work today, somebody stopped me and handed me this beautiful portrait kind of depicting the catch. And it's just so many people, it is, it, it, the way that it's impacted so many football fans, not just 49ers fans, but just the game of football. And I even remember growing up, uh, my dad was a huge 49ers fan and I'm from Southern California. Mm -hmm. Me growing up, uh, we didn't necessarily have a team in LA at that point, um, well, when I was growing up, but uh, he remembers everything about that play and 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 I remember when uh we had our Dwight Clark day during um the season two seasons ago I we were live streaming that on our website and I just remember as soon as it went off I had a message from my dad like did you get to meet Dwight that's my guy that's my guy and and I feel like that's 
that's the sentiment around him. Everyone just enjoys who he is as a person, not just what he did on the field. Yeah, and you know, we got so many letters from people who, who would say, you know, that time I met you, you acted like you were so happy to meet me. And he was the kind of guy that uh, you, you left a, a, any kind of conversation with him thinking, wow, you know, we, we really connected there. He connected with, with everybody. He had a lot of best friends. And, you know, there are ALS families here today. And, uh, you know, kind of the, the thing that, that really struck me in seeing how Dwight lived his life at the end was how he didn't let ALS affect him at all. He was still Dwight. You know, he still loved company. He loved to tell stories. He loved the interaction with, you know, his friends. Um, he, 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 just, he never, ever stopped being Dwight. But also, you know, those were some great 49er teams. I'm, I'm here to tell you that as good as they were, those teams were on the field, better off the field. Wow. You wow. know, you know Keena Turner. Absolutely. So you know what the, uh -huh. what kind of guy he is. But Ronnie Lott did above and beyond. You know, as far as just being a friend and being compassionate and being loving and supportive, and I just those are just two guys. But so many of these guys went out of their way. Even coaches from those teams went. You know, flew cross country to spend an hour with Dwight and then got on a plane and went right back. And he, he was that kind of guy who would bring out that, but also speaks to the family atmosphere that I think any professional sports or any, any organization, not just sports. Yeah. If you're working, if you're working in the offices of the 49ers, if you're at Intel, if you're at wherever, if you're at SAP, you still want those bonds. You want to create that kind of, of uh, that, that union, you know, mm -hmm. among people. And to see how Dwight's former teammates rose to the occasion for him and were there for him and really helped him just live, live a great, you know, last few months of his life from the standpoint of he was doing what he wanted to do. You talk about Dwight being able just to bring his teammates together. Which leads me to Tuesdays with Dwight. Yeah. Um, I wasn't there, so I, I can't really speak on the dynamic. But from what I understand, Dwight, just the person he was, would bring all of his former teammates together to commute, to kind of talk about the good old days. Yeah, a lot and, of laughs. Uh, yeah. As they would say, a lot of lies. <laughs> <laughs> a lot of laughs, a lot of lies. But kind of paint that picture for me. Uh, Tuesdays with Dwight, sitting around, having lunch. What was that about? Yeah, it was about Dwight wanting to be with his guys. You know, he knew that he wasn't going to be on this on this planet for, for much longer. Or at least, you know, he knew that it was a it was a finite amount of time that he had left, and so he just wanted to to reconnect. He wanted to see, you know, Lawrence Pillars, you know, coming in from the East Coast. He wanted to see all these guys, um, you know, just flying cross country and spending time with them. And all those guys were willing to do that. So it was generally at the the uh, Paradise Grill in Capitola, right on the water, and they have a little little room there, a little patio that overlooks uh, the the ocean. And it would be, you know, whatever it would be, t two hours or so of people just sitting around drinking some iced tea and ordering lunch and just having a great time. And one of the, we have a lot of really cool book events coming up. Uh, you know, I'm signing autographs out here, the book's for sale for the first time. Uh, and then tonight at Pete's Tavern in San Francisco, which is right across from Oracle Park, the Giants game. People probably leaving the Giants game can go over there. There'll be a lot of former 49ers, uh, Ronnie Lott, Keena Turner, Eric Wright, Dwight Hicks, Dwayne Board, Mike Wilson, Mike Schumann, Steve <laughs> Bono. I think I, I think I nailed them all. I think I got them all. <laughs> wow. So all those guys will be there. Okay. But one of the really cool book events, and people, if you want to kind of see what we have planned, go to letters87.com. It's, it's just the one-stop shop for everything about this book. But we're going to have a book signing on a Tuesday at in Capitola at the Paradise Grill. Really? Yeah, and I know Steve Mariucci is going to be there. There might be some other uh, people who are close to Dwight who attended those lunches in Capitola. But it's going to be great because it's going to be 
the environment that Dwight was in. And so there's going to be a special vibe there because oh, of that. That's so special. And that's letters to 87.com for more yeah. information on any of the upcoming signings and also to get your hands on the book. Uh, I know fans here in attendance at open practice, a certain amount got to get, get a copy. Also, yeah. uh, the 49ers website 49ers.com also having a get up giveaway so make sure you guys check that out but if you want to get your hands on a book letters to 87.com uh it's absolutely incredible and, and can i give you a little scoop yeah i don't know if i'm supposed to say this oh, tell me but i found out much later the 49ers organization deserves a lot of credit because I, I didn't find out this until much much later but uh 49ers ownership and management jed york al guido they uh did a a really phenomenal job completely behind the scenes of you know, covering a lot of the expenses uh, having to do with the lunches and bringing people in wow. and I know for that, that the 1981 82 team that came in for Dwight Clark Day uh -huh. uh, they were very generous very much behind the scenes under the radar so um, I know that they I, you know they probably didn't want that out there but I feel like you know what y you deserve credit and uh, like, I, again, nobody here was blowing their own horns about this, but people, other people were telling me um, that some of the, you know, that, that the organization really went above and beyond. And I know Dwight appreciated that. And certainly uh, those who uh, were impacted in a positive way, uh, feeling the, the generosity of the organization felt yeah. it too. So I just wanted to wow. say that. That's huge. Also, uh, something to highlight, while it's also an open practice, we have over 30 alumni here today wow, at great. practice for 8-7 Day Dwight Clark Day. Uh, some of those names, we, Ronnie Lott's here, uh, Charles Haley's here, uh, Ricky Waters here. Um, they're also joining fans over at Community Corner. Not sure if you're familiar with what Community Corner is, but uh, at every open practice, the 49ers host a different organization or a different cause that the players uh, choose to support. And today, uh, there's some families uh, who are related to the ALS uh, disease, whether if someone has it or it's a family member. So a lot of those alumni are joining them there today. And also there's a reception going on after practice that you're a part of, right? Yeah, the, there's, those families are going to be heading over to the museum. I believe the museum's open uh, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, mm -hmm. right, and, and game days. Right. Uh, so the museum isn't open today, but that space is going to be uh, kind of uh, opened up for the families, uh, the the ALS patients and, and their families. So uh, that'll be that'll be great. And I know there will be people from the organization saying a few words, and and um, I will I will get up and and talk. I, I believe to the to the families as well. And and the point that I'm going to talk about is just how much you know how much team and family means. Yeah. You know when when somebody's going through this. I mean I, I saw it firsthand with Dwight. I saw how he enriched the lives of the people who are around him and I saw how those around him enriched his life yeah. and so it's, it's a group effort and uh, you know the, the the patients going through it, it it's tough it's also very tough on the friends and family so it, it really is a, a group effort uh, it's team it's family it's uh, you know everybody has a role to play everybody has a vital role to play just like just like this football team we're yeah. seeing out here, but but on a grander scale because it's the game of life. Absolutely. All right, got to give it to us again. How can fans get a hand on a copy of Letters to 87? And where can they find you? If I, if I want my <laughs> copy signed by the Matt Mayoka, where do I go? Well, uh, that's a good question, but I, I guess, you know, I will be at all those book events. Okay. If you already have a book or you want to order one online and you can you can order, there, there are links to order the book at letters 87com um, hopefully I'll be around. Um, I know I'm not supposed to necessarily be like signing autographs on the field before games and stuff like that, but, but, uh, hopefully people can track me down cause, uh, it, it's a project I'm very proud of. Um, and I just, uh, you know, what, whatever the fans want, if they, if they want to buy a book and not have my fingerprints on it, <laughs> I'm fine with that too. Uh, but it's, and, and I don't even know if we mentioned or I mentioned that, 100% of the royalties 
go to the Golden Heart Fund. That's incredible. And, and so Dwight's charity of choice, and this goes back to what I was talking about, team and being a teammate, mm -hmm. he wanted to take care of, quote unquote, his guys. I want to take care of my guys. And so the Golden Heart Fund is the organization that the Yorks uh, gave a million dollars in seed money. Mr. DeBarlow gave a hundred or a million dollars in seed money. Mm -hmm. And it's an, it's an organization that gives a hand up, not a handout to former 49ers in times of emotional, uh, physical, and financial need. So it's a great organization and it's the one that Dwight wanted all of the proceeds, any money generated, any publicity generated from uh, the documentary that we did on NBC Sports Bay Area and for this book project to go to. And Cameron Company has been awesome. They took a very, I mean, they just basically, let's cover our costs <laughs> and then the rest, yeah. Golden Heart Fund. So Cameron wow. Company, big shout out to them. Without them, this book doesn't this book doesn't happen. That's absolutely huge. Uh, Matt Mayoko, 49ers Insider, NBC Sports, Bay Area, right here for your 49ers live look in. Uh, as you're taking a look at practice, the 10th training camp practice, does it feel like it's been 10 days? It doesn't. Does doesn't, it? Doesn't it kind of seem like it's flown? A it, it, bit? It's flown by a little bit, and it's crazy. I'm not when sure you, why that is. I, no idea. No clue. But it's crazy when you think about it. There, there's a preseason game in a few days. There is. Yeah. Against the Dallas Cowboys. <laughs> oh, I mean, let's irony. bring let's bring it full circle. Why don't we? So I do want to talk to you a little bit about practice. By the way, I'm, there are a lot of stories in this book or letters in the book that don't talk about the Cowboys in very uh, uh, flattering terms. Uh oh. <laughs> so you most definitely want to make sure you get a hand on a copy of Letters to 87. Uh, but a little bit about practice. Um, again, now we're going into our 10th day, but coming into training camp, was there ever like a position group that you kind of saw as like, okay, I, I kind of see how this is going to shake out. But once the days of training camp kind of continued, you were like, okay, wait a minute. Things are kind of shaking up a little bit. I, I see somebody kind of emerging. Any, anything that's kind of taking you by surprise? Well, I mean, when you talk about position groups, whenever you're out there on the 49ers practice field and you just say position group, the first thing I think of is defensive line, defensive <laughs> line, because that defensive line looks really good, uh -huh. and Nick yeah. Bosa looks good. And I, I don't really want to talk too much about a rookie, but, man, he, he looks like he's been out here for, for years. Yeah. Um, I, you know, the, the, the interesting thing is there are two. Uh, to me, the, the playmakers, you know, the wide receivers, are really, really a lead dog hasn't just asserted himself. Uh -huh. I think Dante Pettis is going to have a good season. I think he's going to build on what he did last year. But I think Trent Taylor is a guy who's really going to catch a lot of passes and be the third down guy. And then we'll see what Debo Samuel does. But it's wide open. I mean, there are guys that you can look at and say, hey, he could end up being the number one receiver on this team. And then you could pause five seconds and go, <laughs> that is if he makes the team. Right. You know, because it's so balanced. Um, running back is a position that I'm, I'm kind of fascinated by because Jarek McKinnon is just now cleared off the PUP list. Right. He's kind of working back into the mix. I'm sure they're going to pump the brakes on him pretty much in the, in, the, uh, in the exhibition season. But Tevin Coleman, extremely talented, will probably be you know the first in 10 guy. Uh, Matt Breida showed last year what he can do, which is – uh, he can do a lot, yeah. 5.3 yards a carry, and now he's going to be like battling and scratching and clawing just to get a, a uniform on game days. Right. And, and where does Jarek McKinnon fit in? He's a great receiver, you know, maybe more of a third down guy, but somebody that Kyle can use. I, I think Kyle is uh, Kyle Shanahan is going to have a field day trying to figure out all the pieces <laughs> and keep the defense guessing. It's a good problem to have <laughs> for yes. Kyle Shanahan and the 49ers. Uh, I want to talk about years prior. We come out to camp and there's we usually see like one of those undrafted guys, one of the undrafted mm -hmm. guys that really stand out. And years prior, it's been the Matt Breedas and it's been yeah. the Kendrick Bournes. Last year, it was even tight end Ross Dwelly. But now looking into this year, is there maybe even if he's not undrafted, but is there an underrated guy that's kind of caught your attention? Yeah, I, I, there are two that come to mind. The, the first one is he's not, well, he's undrafted, but he's already been in the league a year. That's Ross Dwelling. Yeah. I mean, to me, he's pretty clearly the number two tight end on this team. You know, he makes a lot of plays. And so he's had a really good camp. And he's light years ahead of where he was a year ago at this time. Uh, the other guy that, that I hear a lot of people talking about, people on the, on the team talking about undrafted, is Leroy Reynolds. The linebacker uh -huh. who's who's made some plays, he's flashed. I think he's got a good mentality. Again, it's going to be tough for him to make a spot, you know, to have a spot on this team. But I think at the very least, what he's done is wrapped up a practice squad position, and 
I bet the 49ers are a little bit concerned that if he plays really well during camp, um, I guess it's a good problem to have. If he plays really well during the games when everybody's watching, all the, the 31 other teams are paying attention to this, uh, you know, he could get plucked off the waivers. Mm-hmm. So they, they might be in a position kind of similar to Richie James last year where it's like, well, can't afford to cut him and just put him on the practice squad because someone's going to claim him. Right. So he's in a position, I think, uh, as, as an undrafted rookie, Leroy Reynolds, number 50 uh, linebacker. I think he's in a position to – to, to win a spot on the 53 man. Uh, another position I do want to t- chat about uh, as we're winding down in the final minutes of the 49ers live looking, uh, I want to talk about Tarvarius Moore actually. Uh, moved over yeah. from corner to safety. He's been getting first team reps with Jimmy Ward. Uh, he's on the field. He was activated off of PUP, but still in the blue non contact jersey, not doing uh, individual or team drills yet. But I feel like that's a guy who's also flashed in a position that wasn't necessarily addressed this offseason. Yeah, I mean, the, the way the 49ers decided to address it was by re-signing Jimmy Ward. Mm-hmm. And that's something that I think, kind of, I think kind of the closer you are to this team, you realize what Jimmy Ward means to the team and what the coaching staff thinks of Jimmy Ward and what the management thinks of Jimmy Ward. And I think the further back you are and you don't see, uh, you don't see Jimmy you kind of lose sight of that and you focus on the injuries. And of course there are, you know, he's had these injuries and that's a major thing, but Jimmy Ward will be a starter if he's healthy. He's the, the 49ers really like him and they've showed that, you know, they brought him back for another season. But what I think Tarverius Moore has done, I don't think he's ready to be a starter yet, but he's at the position that, that his future is at. He's at free safety. Mm-hmm after spinning last year cornerback and I think you know you could look at this two ways last year was kind of a wasted year because he's playing a different position the other way to look at it is cornerbacks very difficult job and if you are training in those skills it's going to make you a better safety and it's also going to make you a better safety because now you have a really good idea what the cornerbacks are doing so I don't think Tarverius Moore is ready to be a starter week one but week five six seven if you know if Jimmy has to go out of the lineup or whatever, I think Tarverius Moore has put himself in that position to go in there. So that's another interesting competition, Tarverius Moore and Adrian Colbert. Right. And I guess to a degree, Jimmy Ward, all kind of vying for that same position. Absolutely. Uh, last thing, um, I always get questions every day. Everyone wants to know. How's Jason Verrett looking? Does he look healthy? And it brings me back to uh, Richard Sherman. Uh, Last year, he said he was playing on one leg, essentially. He uh, he was a year removed from that Achilles injury. Uh, Same thing with Jason Verrett, but from what you've seen so far, 10 days in, what's been your Well, it's funny you say that because as you you were asking your question, I was thinking – I think Jason Verrett's moving a lot better this year than Richard Sherman was last year. And, in fact, I think Richard Sherman was pretty vulnerable last year, and I think we all knew that, but the other teams didn't, or they just said, we're, we're going to go the other side. Right. Why, why, why mess with Richard Sherman? That's Richard Sherman. Yeah. Well, this year, Richard Sherman is Richard Sherman. Yeah. You know, he's moving better. I think there's going to be pretty good competition. You know, Verrett looks pretty good, and, and Verrett has that mentality that you know the, the, the teammates love, the team loves. Akella Weatherspoon's playing pretty well, too. Yeah. He looks good. So I think the 49ers are going to be in better position because of that, of Richard Sherman being a better player, able to move better, do the things that make him Richard Sherman, but also Jason Verrett and Akella Weatherspoon playing at a high level and great competition. There you have it. Ladies and gentlemen, Matt Mayoko, 49ers insider, NBC Sports, Bay Area. Uh, I think that was our, our cue that we've got to wrap this up. All right. Can I say, Kiana, thank you so much for having me on no, this. This I, was great. I love this. Thank you for being here. Uh, we really, really appreciate it. Super excited about the book. Again, letters to 87com Make sure you guys get your hands on a copy. Absolutely incredible. Again, Matt, thank you so much. And 49ers fans, tune into 49ers.com for any updates on Dwight Clark Day as well as 49ers training camp presented by SAP. Enjoy the rest of your week.